Good morning. Welcome to worship with us here at Macrocenta Presbyterian Church. We hope that your spirit will be lifted, drawing closer to God this hour as we sing his praise, listen to the reading of his word, and receive instruction in the path of righteousness. The Bible says to come into God's presence with singing. Let's do just that. Welcome to today's service. Here are some of the events coming up at La Crescenta Presbyterian Church. Registration for the Dominican Republic Outreach Mission Trip will close tomorrow, Monday, April 25th. Your registration form and $400 deposit are due by that deadline. Peak continues on Wednesday evenings with dinner at 545 and classes and events beginning at 630. Andy will continue his class More Like Jesus, while Lee is continuing his new class called Living Wisely, discussing how to live a truly meaningful and joyful life. There are also adult small groups for couples and parents and activities for children and students. 
Next Sunday, May 1st, we will have a single combined communion service in the sanctuary, followed by fellowship and light breakfast in Koopmans Hall and the courtyard. It will be a great opportunity to meet new people and welcome new newcomers. Gary Woodward is still recruiting men of good voice to sing in the Mother's Day Men's Chorus on Sunday, May 8th. Please contact Gary for all the details. On Sunday, May 15th at 2 p.m., the deacons will present Strike Up the Band, a benefit performance to raise funds for the Deacons Higher Education Scholarship Fund. Vocalists and a 10-piece professional band will perform pop, swing, jazz, gospel, TV, and movie themes in this high-energy show. Tickets will be available in the breezeway after Sunday services at a suggested donation of $15 per adult and $30 per family.
The first reading for today is from Luke 4, 5 through 8. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The word of the Lord. We have all failed our God in all kinds of ways, but he is gracious and kind. And we know that from what we read of him in scripture, what we know of him from our personal experience. He's gracious and ready to receive our prayers and ready to uh, wipe the slate clean for us. So let's go to God in confession. Holy God, we do confess that our love for you is often weak, um, that our efforts to follow you are often half-hearted. We say that we want to be holy as you're holy, but what we really want so often is just to be accepted as we are so we don't have to change. We say that we want you to lead us, but what we really want so often is just the freedom to choose another path. We don't like the one that you have for us. We say that we want what's best for us and for those that we love, but too often we settle for the good that we can secure at a minimal cost. So God, we need your forgiveness. We ask for your forgiveness. Lord, Forgive us for thinking that we know better than you do what's right and what's good for us. Teach us to trust your word and to submit to your spirit. Forgive us for placing a higher priority on our personal comfort than on the work of building your kingdom. Lord, change us. Fan the flames of our faith so we'll want what you want and we'll seek the joy and peace that can only come from doing your will. And we pray today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our second reading for today is Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The word of the Lord. Please join me for a prayer. Lord God, I thank you for this time for us to gather together, even in this virtual format, to come together, study your word, and learn of you. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time Help my words uh, minister to people. May they be received in love. And would your just presence fill up this space right now, God? Amen. All right. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. This one's pretty familiar, right? I guess if you'd spent any amount of time here at LCPC, you've heard this one a few times. I mean, it's pretty much the basis for those wildly important goals that we've been setting out to do. In fact, it's the basis for a lot of things. Outreach, global missions, the importance of baptism. It's a pretty key passage. But I think, if we're being honest, there's a part that we skip past in it. At least, I skip past in it. I kind of skip to the actual commission part. Go! Make disciples. It's snappy. It's clear. But that's not where Jesus begins. Now, Jesus actually begins the Great Commission with a statement. 
a statement about himself. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. So if Jesus connects that statement with the actual commission, with that word, therefore, then it's important for us to understand what this authority piece means. So what does Jesus mean here? Remember, this passage comes after all of the Easter events we were talking about last week. It comes after Palm Sunday. It comes after the cross. It comes after the resurrection. In fact, Matthew, the one who records this in his gospel, doesn't seem concerned with telling us much more about post-resurrection Jesus, except for this moment, this statement from him. So clearly, this is big news. It's also a new thing. Jesus is talking about a new reality, post-cross, now. After Jesus has gone through the suffering and death of the cross, after Jesus has triumphantly risen, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to him. So what does that mean? Well, I can tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that Jesus is somehow more God than he used to be. Jesus is fully God and fully man before and after his resurrection. This also doesn't mean that Jesus has some new superpower that he got by crossing through death. This isn't a Hollywood movie where the hero gains or perfects some new power in the third act that changes the tide of the film. No, Jesus is talking about a new status, a new moment in redemptive history. Something in the world order has changed. We're in a new moment where the kingly authority over all of heaven and all of earth has been given to the Son. To fully feel the significance of this, we actually have to go back before the earthly ministry of Jesus began. See, at the beginning of some of the gospel narratives, there's a story, a true story. I always try to emphasize that with the kids that I work with. When we're talking about a story about Jesus, we're talking about a true story. So there's this true story in the Gospels where Jesus is out in the wilderness. He's fasting. He's probably getting ready for his ministry to begin. And the evil one, Satan, sees Jesus in that bodily weakness of fasting and decides to try his hand with him. So he comes to tempt Jesus, and he does so three times. Well, there's one specific temptation in that set of three that I want to focus on today. It's the one that we read earlier. See, Satan comes to Jesus, and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world, all their authority and splendor. They can be yours because they are mine. All you have to do is worship me. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems like a bold claim from Satan. All authority and splendor of the nations has been given to Satan? That can't be right. All right, come on, Jesus, dispute that liar. But Jesus doesn't dispute that. Rather, Jesus responds to the temptation by quoting scripture, you shall only worship the Lord your God. So is Satan telling the truth here? Does Satan really have this kind of authority? The scary answer is, yeah, or at least he did. For at this point in time, if you looked over every person on earth, you would see allegiance not given over to the rightful king, the Lord Most High, but instead given over to the deceiver, the evil one, Satan. Now, what did this really look like? Well, I can tell you that it didn't look like a bunch of people just going around praising Satan. It didn't look like a bunch of buildings with pentagrams on them where we have crosses. 
it didn't mean people walking around with scary goats on their shirts. No, it doesn't even mean that everyone was worshiping fake gods that were satanic powers in disguise, though that was an element of it. Remember, one of the few groups of people that Jesus directly linked with Satan were the Pharisees, those who knew the name of God and believed that they served him. Yet Jesus said that they were so aligned with Satan that he was their father. Now, Satan's authority over the world meant that it was a world sold as slaves to sin. It was a world of disobedience. The Apostle Paul states in many of his letters that before Christ, we were children of wrath. And that's why it's so important to see the meaning behind Satan's name. See, in Hebrew, Satan didn't seem to originally be a name. It was more of a title. It translates to the adversary. And that is who Satan is at his core, the adversary. Satan's goal is to have the whole world serve him, but he doesn't do so by making his own name great. Instead, Satan, the adversary, just wants to ruin God's name. See, Satan's kingdom is a kingdom where God is not served, where God is not even known. And it's in that way that Satan can genuinely make this claim. At this point in history, Satan truly had the authority of the nations. And he knows it's that authority that Jesus is seeking. Jesus came to the world to free us from the bondage of sin and death. And he was going to have to go through pain and suffering and rejection. But Satan offered Jesus a different route. You don't have to suffer to gain the authority over the world. I'll just give it to you. It doesn't have to hurt. All I want you to do in return is worship me. Satan is offering Jesus the prize without the cost. No cross, no death, no suffering. But Jesus knows better. Jesus knows that to bow the knee to Satan would place himself under Satan. The world would not be freed, its slavery instead would be sealed. So Jesus chose the harder way, the way that meant laying down his life for us. Jesus chose the cross. Jesus chose to bear the weight of sin and descended into death, suffering on our behalf. And then came resurrection. Jesus rose again, not in a way that somehow rewound his body to a moment before his death. No, Jesus truly resurrected. He came out on the other side of death, the firstborn of the new creation. And in doing so, Jesus defeated sin and death. And let me tell you this. He also took that throne from Satan. By this victory, Jesus took everything that gave Satan the right to claim authority. Humanity no longer needed be a slave to sin and death. Humanity could once again re-enter relationship with God through the Son. And it was through this Son, this Jesus, that all of this was accomplished. So God the Father, seeing the work of Christ, bestowed upon the Son the authority over the earth that had been taken from Satan. And God the Father also gave the Son authority over all the heavens. See, we miss it, but when Jesus steps out of that grave, God's anointed one becomes the crowned king. His kingdom is now coming in full force. Satan's kingship, gone. Jesus' kingship, established. That is what Jesus is coming to tell his disciples. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given over to Jesus. He is king. Now go proclaim that 
and make disciples of the nations. Now, there are many directions we could go with this, but I have three primary points to look at as we process through this identity of Jesus's. So if you're a note taker, here are your three points. All right, first one, recognize that the battle is a battle between a victorious king and a deposed tyrant. Once again, the battle is a battle between a victorious king and a deposed tyrant. All right, deposed is not a word we hear all the time. A quick search on Google defines deposed as removed from office suddenly and forcefully. It speaks to when a king or any figure of authority has been removed from their seat of power. And that is the reality with Satan. Satan had this world under his thumb, but Jesus defeated Satan. And there's no power nor scheme that Satan could use to reverse that. But obviously, as a power-hungry tyrant that's been removed from their throne, Satan is not happy about that. Like a snake mortally wounded, Satan has not laid down and accepted his defeat. No, instead he has lashed, attempting to fill the world with his evil, to overcome all with temptation and unbelief. Satan is fighting tooth and nail but it's too late for him. His fate is already sealed. Satan has already lost his right to the throne because Jesus is the triumphant one. This is important, friends. When we stand and we look at evil, it feels overwhelming. It feels like evil is the bigger force, or at least a foe much grander than we are. But no matter how big that evil may appear, Satan is not the victor. Jesus is. We do not live in a world where evil is stronger than good, nor is it even of equal strength. Satan is not a God standing equal and opposite to God. Satan is not king. Satan is vengeful, but he is altogether hopeless. Satan's goal is to distort and pervert God's name. But friends, we've a glimpse into eternity, and we know that's not happening. No matter how much Satan may buffet, our hope stays in the victory of King Jesus. And this changes how we think about temptation. Friends, there are temptations in this life. There are times where we still feel the overwhelming urge to live as separated from God, partaking in those things we know that God does not have for us. The presence of these temptations, however, is not a sign that Satan is stronger than Jesus. That is a lie that I have believed before, and so I want to say it again. These temptations, their presence is not a sign that Satan is stronger than Jesus. Rather, as Austin helped point out to me the other day, these temptations and burdens are a signal of Satan's waning power. Satan is threatened when he sees us living for the glory of God. Every person living in relationship to God is a sting against Satan's plan. And so Satan desires to afflict us, to make us believe that we can't be in relationship with God. But we do not have to listen to Satan's desperate attempts to steal us from the Savior's kingdom. He is attempting to rebuild a kingdom that is actively falling apart in front of him. Jesus, on the other hand, he is victorious. When temptation comes, he is the one that we run to because he's already won the fight. He's the one in triumphant power. We read in scripture that the Lord allows these temptations to take place for the strengthening of our faith. If temptation scares you, remind yourself of this. The purpose of this temptation is not for you to stand in your own strength, but rather 
for us to cleave closer to the King, King Jesus, who stands in victory and majesty over and against the evil one. When temptations come, that is where we can go. That is who we run to. All right. So we move on to our second point. We need to recognize that this world is habituated to the wrong kingdom. I'll say that again. Recognize that this world is habituated to the wrong kingdom. Yes, Jesus' throne is established. All authority has been given over to him. But I don't think it's a surprise to anyone here when I say not everyone is living for him. In fact, it can be hard to see the present world as living in any closer relationship to God. If Satan was truly kicked off the throne and all authority now belongs to Christ, then what's going on here? Well, we need to recognize that though the new kingdom of the one true king has come into the world, the world is resistant to change. The truth is, we like living in the old way. We like living without a relationship with God. Isn't it easier if I'm the one in control of my own life? If I can be the one to take care of my financial security, to make all of my plans, and to decide what is good for me, to decide what is bad for me? That's the way we've lived our life. It's familiar. Why change? Well, this has been the way of our world. Our world stays in the functions of the old kingdom. A life lived without relationship with God. And friends, we have to be cautious of this. Because we too are inclined to live in the manner of the old kingdom, the old way. There are things that we have picked up from this world that come from the old kingdom. But we see from the teaching of Jesus that his kingdom looks fundamentally different. Throughout the scripture, we see the repeated instruction from God, be holy as he is holy. That word holy carries the meaning distinct. We need to recognize that this world carries with it many ways of the old kingdom, and we need to be distinct. We need to live according to Jesus's kingdom. I want you to be aware that the way of life of Jesus's kingdom is not because God is some arbitrary, rule-loving God. It's not because God is a deity with firm decisions about what is right and what is wrong, and he just wants everyone to conform to that. He's not that Facebook friend with very specific views that they will argue for day in and day out. No, the way that I want to talk about God and the way I've found the most helpful to talk about the way of the kingdom with kids, I think it's the best way for even us to understand the way of Christ's kingdom is to know that God is our Father, our good Father, our Creator. He knows what is best for us. He knows the way we were designed to live. He knows what way of life damages us. First and foremost, God created us to be with him. That is how we flourish. That is what the way of Christ's kingdom is founded upon. It is a way given to us by our creator, whose heart longs for us to live in the good way that he made us to. But the enemy doesn't want us to live that way. He wants us to think that life without God is better. But I can tell you, friends, God knows the best way. I want to be clear, I'm not advocating that we be escapists. I'm not claiming that everything in the world is evil. But we need to be serious about the way of life that we are participating in. 
We have to be cognizant. To live according to the way of the old kingdom is to ally ourselves with Satan. It's to participate and perpetuate a society where self-reliance, self-satisfaction, and self-affirmation are our gods. And it's not just by doing things that one might consider evil. It's to live with the wisdom of the world as our God, as our highest, highest thing to turn to. It's to say, I have a right to be angry with this person when Jesus says to turn the other cheek. It's to insult someone for their beliefs when Jesus makes it clear that to insult your brother is to murder them in your heart. It's to say, I have to be worried about my finances in order to be responsible. When Jesus says, be anxious for nothing. When we let the wisdom of the world have its way in our hearts and minds, dear friends, we deny ourselves the joy of fully abiding in Christ's kingdoms. Christ's kingdom. Friends, let us not try to serve two masters. We have to remove ourselves from the ways of the old kingdom. It's not enough to just serve more. We're not in a game where we try to live more righteously to get more good points to offset the bad points for the ways we adhere to the old kingdom. We have to recognize that to live according to the old kingdom is incongruent to what we've been called into. But here's the joy, because I know some of you might be feeling uneasiness, a pit in your stomach, as you reflect on your own life. Here's the joy. We are being called into this kingdom, and it is a victorious kingdom that lasts forever. It's not easy for us to change the way we live but that is a work that Christ is doing in us. He is preparing us day by day to live in eternity with him. It should not be so that we live according to the way of Satan's kingdom and the way of Christ's kingdom. It does take self-examination. It takes the revelation of God and the conviction of the Spirit. But just like with the temptations, these convictions are not meant to draw us into shame and fear, but a closer relationship with God. Friends, our good Father delights in drawing us into fuller relationship with Him. So we can pray alongside the psalmist in Psalm 139, Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. All right, final point, because it's about time for us to get to the actual commission part. So here's our final point. Recognize that our news is truly good news. I'll say that again. Recognize that our news is truly good news. Friends, if what I've said here today is true and the reign of the evil one has ended and the throne of the Savior is established, well, then that is good news for everyone. And friends, we have to recognize that this news is just that. It's news. We're not just talking about beliefs when we're talking about what we have to spread into the world. It's not some theory. Jesus isn't some guru who we're spreading the wise teaching of. No, our news is about a person and an event. Jesus, the King, the Savior, defeated the evil one and disrupted our bondage to sin and death. Jesus, conquered the grave. He has given us access to the Father, the very one who made us, who knows us, who loves us. And he has entered us into a relationship with himself 
that does not cease, but will last forever. That is life-changing news. That changes everything. We can live the way that we were always meant to live. And when we understand that, of course we want to share it with others. There is no one that is not good news for. So indeed, let us go and make disciples of all the nations. But let's remember, that task starts small. We don't have to fly overseas to do this, though there are many wonderful people who do so, and I have a lot of admiration for you. We also don't have to go stand on the street corner with a sign that says, Jesus is King. Making disciples of all the nations starts at home. It starts by living it. It starts by showing your kids that this kingdom, this good news, really is the most central thing. It starts by praying together, reading scripture together, pressing into God together. It starts by making discourse about God a regular thing. It starts by sharing about your week during Party in the Breezeway and emphasizing the way that God has been present. It starts by praying without ceasing, whether walking down the aisle at Ralph's or just sitting in your car. It starts by asking God how to do our jobs in a way that reflects Him. When you begin to live the gospel as the central thing, you realize that evangelism, making disciples, flows naturally out of it. There was a moment in my life when I realized my relationship with God was so central that I could not genuinely answer the question, how are you, without mentioning God, even when that was to people I knew did not believe. When we show people that this gospel has truly changed our lives, that it impacts every moment of how we live, that's when people see. We begin, they begin to notice and wonder and see our Christian belief as more than just a hobby or a social club or a philosophical belief, but that it's a reality that we live and we breathe. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus, the adversary of God and of every good part of creation has been pushed off the throne. Sin and death have been defeated. That is good news. Let's live that. Let's breathe that. Let's share the good news. <sighs> Father God, I thank you that you have placed the authority over all the heavens and all the earth under the feet of your Son, Jesus Christ. I thank you that we do not live in a world where evil is king, where evil is master, but we live in a world where Jesus' throne is established. Lord, I pray that you would inspire all of us this week to consider this, to consider the kingship of Jesus, to consider who he is, to consider this good news, to see the ways that we are still living in the old man, the old way, and to ask you to lead us in the way everlasting. Lord, would you search us? Would you know our hearts? Would you lead us in that way? Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you that for all that you are doing. Lord, I pray that you would bless each and every person who these words come to. Would you guide them in your good way? In your good name we pray. Amen. From all of us here at Makrasenta Presbyterian Church, thanks again for joining us in worship this morning. We trust this has been an hour of blessing and encouragement to you. 
If you find yourself drawing closer to God and would like to know more about what it is to follow Christ, please reach out to one of us here at the church. As we go out to begin our week now, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We'll see you again next Sunday, either in person or here again online.